Wow, it's sunny. Good sunny morning, um, everybody. What a glorious spring day. Uh, I thought just before we begin, and I've, you know, I've done actually something that is obvious, really, technically, but last time we did this, we I filmed it with the camera switched around so I could see what was in the screen, uh, which was very strange. Don't know why I did that, but this time, Sarah, my wonderful assistant, Hello. Really very grateful is doing this, helping me here, as can see what's going on, but I can't. But what I would like to know, because I checked last night to see if the video quality, the sound was okay, and it wasn't very good. So it's possible I might have to abandon this completely. I'm, I'm hoping not. So it'd be great if you could give me a thumbs up uh, if the sound and I'm not pixelating and freezing. How is it? Any? Yeah, good, good sound, good. Okay, so today I thought we'd just kind of walk around the garden. Now, one thing I'd say about that, you might have like a tiny little garden or no garden, but I'm, I'm very lucky to live in an amazing house share where there's a huge range of plants, but also with a, with a landlord that is aware enough of the importance of just letting the garden go wild to a certain extent. And from that point of view, the things that we're going to see today, a lot of them are things that you might find in a small garden. You might just have one of these plants or very nearby, very common. A lot of them are very common. Um, also just kind of on the edge of urban areas. So we look at about kind of 10 salad items and also we look at some a, a bit of a process with various things. And so I thought I'd, I'd start here because you know it's as good as anywhere but there's some, some nice plants which I noticed I was drawn to yesterday as I was walking by and they're, they're in flower over here. There. And it's a nice, I'll, I'll, pick, I'll pick a whole one just so you can see. And there we are. Can you see that well? So in previous video, we saw a related species, another cardamine species, which was cardamine pretensis or cuckoo flower or lady smock in very damp places. And we are in a damp wood and I, I showed you that. This is this one is cardamine hirsuta. Hirsuta meaning meaning hairy. So it's hairy bittercress. So I don't know if you can see just the, when, when, it's, when it's sunny like this sometimes you can pick up hairs more easy. You can see that the hairs on the stem. So yeah a hairy plant but it's you know it's not as hairy as a woolly bear or, or your cat or something like that but it's certainly hairy. Now sometimes yeah, names can be really useful. Hairy bittercress, we know that's a botanical feature of this plant. Bitter, mm. that's, that's very subjective. Now this is definitely not as bitter as a wild lettuce or something like feverfew. Uh, have you ever tried that? Um, great if you've got a migraine, but for a salad, way too bitter. This one, for my um, palate, is really not that bitter at all, but it's, it's, a, good, it's a good tasty, very cressy flavoured salad plant that you could use. So we could use the leaves. This time of year the stems are a little bit tough. So I'm going to pick the leaves off, kind of like that. You see that? And just the sprigs with the flowers on, which are also great for the salad. Put those in there. And get some more. There's more just by Oh, actually, have a look at this one. It's just interesting to see the kind of growth form of many members of the, the cabbage family. They have these long stems where the seed pods form. So that's, that's just a, that's hairy bittercress at a slightly later stage. Ooh. 
Also, sometimes you get some purpling in the leaf. A bit like watercress, really, it does that. So. back so just going to there's something that's when you're working with wild plants it's always good to think about could you spread the seed and I saw here yesterday you see all this here someone from there so this is hairy bittercress which because it's in a sunnier location it's a bit more advanced at stage of growth and uh, it's virtually all going to seed now so I don't know if you can see this but if we can zoom in it's got an amazing mechanism on the seed where it just kind of explodes at uh, the seed pod it just explodes seeds maybe it needs to be a little drier but I, I'll try Whoa. <laughs> I don't know if you can ah! <laughs> like they're going in my eyes. So, so, uh, look, I'm just like, so you see in my hand there's a few seeds, but I think Sarah, did you get some in your yeah, eyes? Yeah. Yeah, because they shoot far, quite far. Um and so there's a few. And look, I can spread them over there. Let's just do that once more. Let's see if you can did you see them? Did you see yeah. them on the turn it once more? I got those ones they're right over here. Ah, they're, they're kind of hopping around like fleas. So yeah, we could eat these seeds. They're slightly kind of mustardy, but when I when I gather seeds from plants like this, the cabbage family, some of them have that mechanism of releasing the seeds, not all. But ones that do, what I tend to do is put a brown paper bag over them and then kind of shake and they're like that and uh then you've got them if you want to eat them. So that was hairy bittercress. Now around here there's, look isn't that beautiful? So this is, this is a, this is a forget-me-not. Now there's quite a few forget-me-nots and this is something that really can just use in small quantities to put on your salad because it's so beautiful. Or maybe a, who knows, a panna cotta or whatever you're making. Maybe some biscuits even, you could put them on those. So what I'm gonna do is a separate little bag for flowers because I'm gonna wash everything very well for this salad later because there are, we do have a bit of a problem with rats here at the moment. You might have heard the chickens earlier and uh, the rats have fattened themselves up on chicken food so we're trying to bring that under control. So it means I need to wash things very well. I've got some of those. So this is always wonderful, is uh, the first leaves of the beech when they burst forth. Now there's this beautiful time in the spring when the leaves of many trees, they're just this, this really vibrant, sunny, kind of yellowy green. And then later on, they go a darker green. So it's, just, it's something to really enjoy for a couple of weeks when some leaves come out. So ha have a look at this. So these are very kind of very kind of floppy and you know like they've just been born like a newborn baby these leaves are. So I'm just gonna take a few for the salad. Now it's still got the slightly resinous seed cases. No sorry not the seed cases the uh, the leaf bud cases around but they won't do any harm really. So that's our first salad leaf. 
go. Another bag. I've got these bags because they are so useful, particularly when it's hot like this, to put your salad leaves in, particularly with a tiny little bit of water and you can keep it fresh for an hour or two while you're out. I know sometimes I've done filming for TV and they, you know, they really love like wicker and stuff. And I say, well, you know, actually what I normally have is plastic bags. And they're like, oh, plastic bags? You know, that's not selling the, the lifestyle, the dream. Oh. Anyway. I have got this for practical reasons too. Watch out, sorry, gonna <laughs> yeah. duck. That happened yesterday, right? That's new. That hasn't hasn't been. No, like no, that it's before. been a while. Oh really? Yes. See, I, I'm just a forager. I don't notice anything. Um, so a couple of other things uh, on the way up here. Actually. Ah, something quite special because often with wild food there's multiple applications for a particular part of the plant or different parts different recipes different usages different categories of use so you know in this in this instance with the beach I'm thinking leaf salad but another thing that we could but another <laughs> another thing we could do how are you doing <laughs> negotiating these logs <laughs> yeah um, is I'm just going to get a few more because there's a lovely drink that you could make. It's called beech leaf noyu, which I think comes from the word nut. Uh, there's various reasons for that, but I'm not going to go into it. But anyway, to make this drink, you get these young leaves in the spring. I guess you could do this with a copper beech as well. I haven't, to be honest, but I think you'd get kind of pinky colours coming out. But, so there we are. And then what you really need is a jar and uh, some gin. And uh, you know sometimes if you're like really lucky you can kind of look around some old logs like this. Oh! And uh, find a bottle of gin. Like <laughs> miraculous eh? So a bottle of gin and I get to do this again and I did this in the first one of these videos for the first time ever so this is the second time ever here is one I prepared earlier so so when when I when you fill a leaf a jar with leaves I really mean fill so you're really like look at that it's really stuffed in there um, when I got these this morning I was I kind of went out like like this and literally I had this kind of full of leaves and I stuffed those in so Got some good quality gin here. The Trumpeter's Secret. Never heard of it before, but anyway, there we are. This is great when you uh, live in a house share, yeah, you can say, has anyone got any gin? <laughs> I really need some gin. So I'm gonna pour that on there. Have a look. Zoom in. Pour that on there. And really fill that up. So this drink, Beech Leaf Noyu, it's a liqueur, essentially, and this is just the beginning of the process. So what we do is we get out all the air there. Is we fill this with leaves and then gin, good quality gin, or to be perfectly honest, probably cheap quality gin. Just as long as it's gin, it doesn't really matter. Um, I'm just going to look, look all that air, squeeze it out a little bit. Then we leave this for a few months. Just put it in your cupboard, strain it off. Then you add the same quantity of brandy. Now it's important at this point that the leaves are completely covered. So yeah, strain it off, add the same quantity of brandy and then, you know, make up about a jar worth of sugar syrup, honey syrup, and you mix them all together. And you've got a gorgeous liqueur, really gorgeous liqueur. So the thing, the thing I do with this, by the way, is in a, in a few hours, the alcohol would have penetrated those leaves a bit more and um, release some of the air. So I'll press it down a bit more because it, they'll leave a gap at the top. And if it's not completely covered, uh, then they can go brown. So I want to keep them kind of nice and green. So you could, of course, just make 
tea with, with these leaves. You could possibly, because this makes a, such a good flavouring in this liqueur, you could, I've never done this, I could imagine you could flavour a vinegar with them as well, that would be nice. So what else is there around here? Um, ah! I just want to show you what you could... It looks superficially similar. So, oh, well, here it is. Uh, but actually, let's just go and look at the one over here. Of course, having the camera switched around this way is that like I can't see any questions <laughs> that you might be... There are no questions. There's no, no questions. Yeah. How are you doing? A lot of waves. So look at these two trees and the leaves. So the leaf shape is quite similar, but the beach here, it's well one one thing. If you look, if you kind of, can you see Sarah, the real, Sarah, Sarah, I'm so sorry, so the, the, the really fine hairs at the edge of that leaf, can you see that? Does it pick, uh -huh. pick up? Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's classic of beech leaves, that almost like downy hairs along the edge of the leaf. Can you see that? Yeah. Now, it has a similar vein structure to the one here, but this one doesn't have um, the hairs at the edge of the tip uh, of the leaf. So this one's hornbeam. And this one's beach, hornbeam and beach. Oh. Let's negotiate through here. So, very often, this is how I do really forage. I just graze like a goat as I go. So another tree that's just bursting into leaf is these birches. You can see that those birches over there. It's a line of birches. But before we get to that, we're going to look at this tree here, which is a pine, and. It's, so pines, you can use the needles, you can use the, the male cones, particularly the immature ones, to make kind of jam and things like this, kind of classic Russian thing. Um, but you can, you can use the, sorry, did I say the, 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 the kind of hard green, uh, ma uh, gosh, get it right, female, they're female, the cones are female. You can, you can work with those to make kind of jam from the immature cones, which we might do in another video. But look now. See if you can get this side, like the pollen that's going to be released. Look at this. Gonna... Can you see that? Yeah. Uh... You get that? And here, this one. See that? Did you, did you capture it? So, so it's a little bit late for this this one. So different pine species will shed pollen from the male. Kind of catkins essentially at different times. These ones I kind of wish I'd come across about I don't know about a week ago because it's shed most of its pollen already. However, let's find another one. Let's let's get a couple. So what I tend to do is I, I find these when the pollen just start. What, what happens? The pollen starts to shed from the bottom ones first. So as soon as that, I see that happening, then I pick the whole cluster, and I try and not not do too many from one tree because actually, or if I do, I'm doing it kind of evenly because actually, above the the uh, the kind of catkins, if you like, is the new leaf where the new leaf growth will be. So if you're taking loads of these in 
from one place it will affect the kind of shape of the tree uh, if that matters but so some of those and it just so happens that yesterday morning Yesterday morning I went out and I got some, there they are, and these, these have been in my room kind of drying overnight and so what I do, what I actually do with these, what I actually do with these is I put this, I put down some newspaper on, on, a, on a hard surface, flat surface, then I put this nylon cloth down and then I lay the um, catkins are just about to shed pollen and every day for about a week as they're drying I gather it all up in this nylon cloth and I give it a shake and it's kind of kind of like this look how's your hay fever <laughs> <laughs> and do you know I'm, in terms of pollen because a lot of I think I, I'm, I'm not sure, and those of you that have hay, hay fever may know whether pine pollen is a particular issue. Because I know some tree pollens are from the catkins, but whether pine pollen in particular is a problem. I know obviously grasses later in the year. So look at all that. So the question is. Why? Always the question, why? Why would you want to harvest pine pollen? Well, it has some extraordinary properties. One of those is medicinal, and, and I'm not a herbalist, but I would encourage you to look at this, is, is tincturing the, the, the pollen. Because I, I, I got this wonderful book a few years ago, and it's just called, surprisingly, Pollen. And it has um, images of pollen grains, like taken from, with an electron microscope or something, so that they you know, blows them up hundreds of thousands of times. Amazing. In that book, it described pollen as being like the diamond of the botanical world. And what it meant by that is just like how hard the kind of relatively speaking that, that the kind of case of the pollen is. So actually, the botanicals that are inside, you can only work with them medicinally, as far as I'm aware, if you tincture them, because that will slowly like ooze them out. And they're known to be very high in kind of plant androgens, so like male sex hormones, if you like. So it's kind of promoted as something to take, particularly for men. Um, I'm less sure about women, but it's yeah something to look into. Look into this if you're interested, just to, to give you a bit of like oomph, like put some lead in your pencils, a phrase I've never used, but it just occurred to me. Like particularly if you're over 40, you know. So just to give you some joie de vie, um, some... A um, bit more mojo. Uh, what other words could we use? Uh, yeah, but it, it certainly works. It, it's a really good thing. But from a food point of view, what's really nice is to kind of put this in flour. So if you're making pancakes, you can put it in. It will give it a wonderful, um, vibrant yellow. If you put it in cakes, maybe like a third of this, it gives a really soft, uh, soft, lovely sponge. If you're making a sponge with this vibrant yellow. Another fun thing that you could do is, I often do, is look at that, it's amazing this tree. Look, it's, it's producing bowls of honey and, te, and uh, tahini, sesame paste. So I like to mix equal quantities, roughly, of sesame paste, honey, and pine pollen. Yeah. Uh, mix. And I put this on top of cakes uh, instead of instead of icing. Right. Mix it all in. What's fun about it as well is that you can, uh, if you get the consistency just right, you can mould it, and it's almost like, in terms of in terms of the texture that the pollen gives to it, it's kind of like an uncooked halva, if you like. You know halva? The kind of Greek, delicious one. Well, if you're like me and you've got a, a bit of a sugar addiction, halva.
Carver is just like a dream, particularly the chocolate one. I had that the other day, that was really good. There's someone asking a question. What's the question? What does it taste of? What does, or does it not have much flavour? Yeah, this is this is a very good question. So the the pollen on its own has a unique unique aroma. It's quite delicate but unique aroma. But in terms of flavour, it doesn't really have a huge quantity of flavour. It's more about um, what the texture and the colour can give to the recipe you're working with. That's the the fun thing working with pine pollen. So look at that. We've got if you've got the consistency right, should be non-sticky to the touch. Have you washed your hands before? I washed my hands, I think, 15 <laughs> times. Yeah, I have washed my hands many times. So look at that. So we have this oh, we, can, we can shape in all sorts of ways. Can I make some eyebrows? It's like disgusting, but yeah, and then we can go. It didn't it didn't work? But um, so essentially, you can mould it like marzipan. I disgust some people because I put it on my face and I ate it, and it went on the ground. Horror of horrors! It went on the ground. Ah! Um, but there we are. It's got the honey. So I was sitting here the other day, and I don't know if sorry if you could get, get this from my perspective. But I was sitting here the other day. Kind of look over there. You see just down, yeah, that's it. Just just down, that's it. So I was sitting here the other day and thinking that just kind of grass around here. But it wasn't just grass, because if you look more closely, something very interesting here. Sorry, you were sorry, I was just getting really relaxed um, sitting against this lovely pine. But can you see this? So this is a member of the carrot family. And I get a leaf. And it's called pignut. Pignut. So it doesn't actually have a nut, but it has a tuber, which is a bit nut-like. It's kind of about that big. And it's one of those things that you can dig for in the spring. Actually, other times of the year as well, but the spring is really good. So actually, come and have, come and have a look here, Si. It's kind of, I used to only find this kind of, when I used to go up to the Lake District, I used to see it a lot. And I used to think, oh, it doesn't grow in the Southeast. But it's notoriously difficult to get like the tuber. So what you need to do, and when it's growing in grass like this, it's often, it's easier in the Lake District because it might be growing near a damp kind of woodland stream or something and without all this grass around. But you go to the bottom of the plant and you see, can you see where it goes down? It trails down that thin stem. You see that? Mm -hmm. That thin stem will go down about that far and and uh, at the bottom <laughs> there should be a nut about that big and guess what I'm gonna I, I will try guess what I prepared one earlier but let's see if it actually I can get this it's gonna be very unlikely but let's just see I might get lucky It's so easy to lose them. Follow that down. Where's it going? <laughs> I think I lost it. <clears throat> hey! Okay, so I did break it off the uh, the stem, but There it is, pig nut. Now, I've never done this before because obviously there's a whole issue around not uprooting plants. 
particularly on land where you don't have permission to be. Like, unfortunately, this is in my garden, and I must say I'm incredibly lucky to be in a place where I've never known a place where there are more pig nuts. There are literally thousands in the front garden, and I keep finding other patches. But an experiment I'm going to do is whether, if you have dug a pig, pig nut, and I don't know, some of you might know this, um, whether there's sufficient rootage on this to continue growing the plant. I expect not. I expect it's just taking all its sustenance from the tuber. But I'm going to plant that later. But I just want to show you over here. So these are two I dug up yesterday. So a kind of typical range of sizes. One much more kind of knobbly, so an older plant. I believe it's a perennial, so it'll keep growing from the same tuber, which will get bigger over the years. How long it is a perennial, I'm not sure. Look at that one. It's almost like it's almost like some kind of earring or some kind of jewellery, the way it just kind of hangs there. So although as far as I'm aware, that outer kind of case won't do do you any harm from a point of view of eating? Oh, lost one. Where is it? Oh, there we are. Look at those. So, so these ones I picked yesterday, and ugh. We're going to work with these in the kitchen very briefly, doing the quickest thing you could possibly do with pig nuts. But you see this one. So this has been what I've done is I've just washed that with an old toothbrush, some water, and then just using a knife, just scrape off, scrape off the outer skin. It's a bit like ginger, actually getting a skin off ginger but it's a little bit thinner you see that's very white isn't it it's very white now the ones I've got here are actually you see that one's more yellow, slightly more yellow. I did that this morning. I skinned that in the same way this morning. So, I can eat these raw. It's a bit like um, it's a bit like a hazelnut. If you've ever got hazelnuts when they're just not quite ripe, and in fact, it's a delicious time to harvest them. They're a little bit like that. And uh, so that that is kind of a size that is kind of worth getting, which I kind of cleaned this morning. And we're going to do something with that back in the kitchen in a bit. Just one thing, um, people are always obviously concerned about yeah, misidentifying, muddling things, and I would say, you know, this is one of those things that maybe you, you'll just pick once in your life, you know, just because, just as an occasional thing to do with, with your kids, um, just for fun. It's not really, you know, something you would get Right, I need to, you know, uh, get some real sustenance. Not all these leaves that Fergus is talking about for salad. I want some real potatoy sub sustenance. And let's get some tubers. What's available? Pig nuts. Yes, let's go and get loads of pig nuts. No, not really. Um, because they're very small. It wouldn't be a sustainable practice, really, at all. But it can be fun just to get some with your kids, ideally with permission. But you know what? Right, if you're in a place where there's loads... And you're with your kids and you see some pig nuts and you want to do that game of tracing down from the root to try and find a pig nut um, and that really inspires your kids and they have great fun that could be like your abiding memory of childhood that then gets them on to you know engage with nature in ways that are really beneficial like later in their life so don't don't avoid like experiences which may be transformative for a child just because you know you're you're concerned about permissions um sometimes yeah you know, i agree yeah we all need to say 
ask the landowner's permission, all the rest of it. But sometimes you've got to see the bigger picture. Now, but I started saying about things that you could muddle it for. But this also comes down to like, you know, small scales, just tracing down with your, your finger to try and get the, the tuber of the pig nut. Now, some, sometimes I know people say, oh, that's difficult, like it's hard to get and they, they snap and you lose them. I just, you know, I just dig them up with a, with a spade. Well, yep, yeah, you could do that. But I don't know, it kind of lost a bit of that, that, that kind of magic, I think, some of that, that, that challenge. But just to be aware, and it's, it's kind of quite unlikely, but I always go on about this plant. I, I really respect and love this plant, and it's lords and ladies. And if you're just digging, you might loosen up a tuber of lords and ladies. And, and here, we, here we've got one. And I'll just snap it off. And you can see it's superficially similar to a pig nut. Now you can get pig nuts that big, and you can get lords and ladies tubers, that are smaller than that, more like that. So that's why I think it's very useful to, to know, make sure that that's not growing around your pig nut, or certainly just trace down and find the genuine pig nut. Don't make the state, mistake of picking Aramaculatum tubers. They used to be used, by the way, I think in like, like 19th century for, um, well, this is about 40% starch in there, the Aramaculatum tubers. And they used to be used for starching shirts, like starching collars and things. And it's kind of interesting because you'll read that in doing that, that people used to get blisters on their neck. And it's to do with the raphids, the microscopic um, calcium oxalate crystals in there, which also means it's not good to eat at all. It can get into your mucous membranes and cause problems. But like, like many plants, apart from just being beautiful and wonderful in their own right, you know, they, they have they have other uses beyond food. But the pig nut we're talking about, and that's what we're going to use in the kitchen. There's but someone asking for leaves of pig nut. The leaves of pig nut. So this will go on to have a flower later in the year, not dissimilar to cow parsley actually, it'd be about this high. It doesn't grow as high as cow parsley, you can see that's how high. Yeah, it doesn't grow as high as cow parsley, but a similar like umble of white flowers on the top. So it's a bit carroty actually, but it's much more of an open leaf than a carrot. And also, I'm not sure if this, this is botanically described as hairless, but I can't see any hairs. I'd say it's probably hairless. Carrot, but it looks very similar to, it's really quite a hairy, hairy plant. Pig nut. Uh, the salad's not very big. I, I thought it would be. So we've got a, a few leaves of birch, which are just for a short time in the spring. You can use them for tea and put a few in a salad. It's just one of those many additions to the whole repertoire of things that you could do, utilize from birch, from the sap to the catkins, to the bark, outer bark for making various things. But, oh, why we're here, no, let's just do it over there. Why we're here, yeah, I'm just gonna do this while I remember, because just a couple of dandelion flowers. Actually, these are really good when they're like this on a lovely sunny day to kind of get and make a light tempura batter, dip them in, take it out, give it a twist, shake off the excess batter, and then deep fry them, a little bit of salt, arrange them on a plate, gorgeous. But I'm gonna use the flowers in the salad. And I 
I mentioned these before, but this is a, a hawthorn hedge. So again, you've got a, a couple of weeks in the spring when the leaves of hawthorn are lovely and tender. Note how I, I grip at the base. Have a look at that. You see it's kind of woody there. What I do is I grip at the base and then pull the leaves off because if you just pull it, yank it off, what can happen is you, you, you end up with like a little woody bit. So it's easier to grip above that and then pull it off. So you can just put straight in your salad. Now something I noticed yesterday, which I've never seen here before, was these plants down here. So we talked in other videos about common sorrel, but this one here is sheep sorrel. It's kind of slightly different, but it has that lovely apple skin sharpness to the flavour. Can you see that in the close-up of the, the little winglets at the, at the bottom? Can you see that? Not winglets exactly, but lobes, really lobed. And it's much more kind of oval and rounded compared to common sorrel, which is also just happens to grow somewhere. I saw it earlier. Where is it? There we are. Can you kind of see, see that? Yeah, so this is common sorrel. And then sheep sorrel. Bit of that. Now, if you kind of look down there, you can see it's kind of quite damp. And I'll tell you why I know this is a damp area. Because can you see that kind of rushy plant? I think that's soft rush. That kind of indicates that it's kind of a damp area. And uh, yeah, often there's like pools of, of water here as well. Like that. Ugh! Oh my goodness, <laughs> look at this. I just thought this was a pool of slime, but it's, um, look, you see that? It's a, uh, it's actually some frog spawn. Um, <laughs> oh my goodness. So I, this is, okay, this is, this is very interesting because this area, it's, it's usually quite damp. I can see it, it's really drying out. And so, um, yeah, do you know what? Now is the time. Have I got any more of those bags? No, yeah, no. Let's just take these flowers out. And I think I'm going to put this in the pond now because it's just going to, it's going to dry out and all these tadpoles are going to die. So let's get them. And I'm going to confess something to you here. This is going to make amends for years ago when I actually cooked and ate some frog spawn. So this is my payback. I'm going to stop them drying out and dying and put them in the pond. Uh, and then I'm just going to, I'm going to show you after that some really interesting plants here. Very interesting because even though I've been working with plants for 30 years, I almost made a mistake this morning with this plant. So talking about how you can make mistakes and how to avoid them, very important. But let's just see if we can... Uh... Sorry, you were saying to me, you haven't been in here yet. So this yeah. is... This is, this is what I mean. Because the pond is in here.
So I'm just, I'm just going to put these in the pond. Actually, why I'm doing it, just to, just out of interest, there's this plant. I think it was introduced by the Victorians called skunk cabbage, which really smells. It's not an edible plant, but you can probably see them at the edge of the pond. And I'm just going to put this in there and then we'll get straight back okay. out. Can you see them, Sarah? Yeah. Clean hands, <laughs> very important. Good seed of the day done. Look at this. Look at this. Look. Oh, the magic of, do of doing things live. <laughs> yeah, the reason I did that there is because it's just exactly one of those things like, oh, you know, there's frog spawn drying out. Uh, later on, when it's more convenient, I'll come and put that in the pond. But, you know, knowing me, I'd start doing loads of other things and completely forget. So that was the moment. Now have a look at this. Can you see these? So in damp, kind of grassy, locations like this. I'm often looking for a plant at this time of year called water pepper, uh, Persicaria polygonum hydropiper. And this isn't it by the way, but I want to tell you about something that was happening this morning is, look at this plant. Does anyone know what that is? Because just going on location, um, habitat, very superficially as I was coming up to it, I was thinking this is water pepper. And just because I was overconfident, and I will admit it, it's slightly embarrassing, but I'm going to admit it, I was overconfident just in my reading of the the habitat, I thought, yeah, this is water pepper. I don't normally pick it this young, but there it is. Um, great, I'm gonna have a taste. So I got some and I had a taste and it's like, whoo, like, wow. Yeah, that is like peppery, wow. Like, yeah, water, water pepper can be quite intense, but yeah, maybe, ah, oh, this is it. When you get it really young, it's like really intense. And, but then I was suspicious because my, my eyes were watering, it was so intense. Um, and then I thought, you know what, I, I've just done that classic thing that um, is not following your own advice, which is really don't eat anything unless you're 100% sure. So I went away and I, I, I was suspicious, you see, and particularly because of the, the growth form. Does anyone know what this is, by the way? And uh, so I discovered it wasn't water pepper and I thought, you idiot, but you know, I only tried a little bit of the, the leaf. So two things I did uh, an hour before this video, I thought, right, I, I need to identify this plant. I was looking through my, my keys. It was quite difficult. I was looking through my wildflower guide, obviously not in flower. Um, it was difficult. I got down to Ranunculus in um, a lovely book called The Vegetative Key to the British Floor, which I mentioned in, in another book, but I also, used something at the same time which is when I'm feeling really lazy or I'm in a hurry and it's an app and I hardly ever use apps for plant identification but I did and it's well worth using it's a good one it's called flower checker so what I did I took three photos of this plant I sent it off to flower checker and botanists look at this and they get back to you within 24 hours um, they got back to me like within the hour which is impressive and it's a ranunculus, one of the buttercup families. And this, this one is a ranunculus flammula, which is, um, a, what was the common name? Spearwort, one of the spearworts, I think creeping, 
are creeping spearwort, Ranunculus uh, flammula. Yeah, not an edible plant, a poisonous plant, but apparently... And then what I did, I think I've mentioned this, I'm going to bury this again. I've mentioned this previously, is that a kind of good thing to do, like, you know, look at, find a plant, try and identify it with your guides, ideally. If not, use something like Flower Checker. They can, you know, they say they've identified your plant, like, with 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 95, 100, occasionally, I'm not sure, I think it's 99% certainty they go to. Um, and then you can go to something like a wonderful site called Plants for Future, which I used this morning. So, I, I send off picture, comes back, uh, Ranunculus flam, flam, flamula. I put that into the database, Plants for Future, comes up with a whole load of information. Is it edible? Is it poisonous? What part of it's poisonous? Just a great thing if you're in, in a hurry. Now, a couple of lovely things over here. How are we doing time-wise? <laughs> Any questions? Are you hearing me okay? Because I know I'm walking away from the camera quite a lot. I don't know if you can, can hear. So just a couple of things in the hedgerow over there. Yeah, oh. thumbs up, thumbs up. Actually, look at those gorgeous daisies. So we, we could put, I'm going to put the, I'm going to put the petals in. Oh, I'll, I'll pick them now, actually. Look. You could put the whole daisy in, in the salad, but it's nice to have some white flowers in the salad. We've already got some. But. Hearing you loud and clear. So uh, we could eat the leaf of the daisy. I made a nice salsa verde with it before it came into flower. That was very nice. Which was basically just garlic and lemon juice and loads of... Oh. Um, I used my salad bag for the uh, tadpoles, but that's, <laughs> that's all right. Um, There's one thing in the hedgerow, which I thought I'd really like to get, and I was looking at it as I walked by this morning, I thought, hmm, this could be, uh, at best, a wonderful massage. Uh, at worst, a kind of self-torture, because it's some gorse, but it's like the other side of the hedge. <laughs> and... Not only that, but this hedge is like mainly holly. Uh, so I'm just going to look at that. I mean, this is I sacrifice I sacrifice myself for the greater good of plant knowledge. Um, can I can I get some? Here we go. <laughs> no. Okay. Can I climb? Oh, get some. Can I just go round the other side? Maybe. Can I? <laughs> there we are. No problem. No scratches. Just no pain. So Gorse, wonderful for just using those sunny flowers to, to brighten up your salad. So I won't even bother picking them off now. I'll pick them off later. So yeah, gorse is something you often see kind of bushes on heathlands. And now you get, in the sunny days, you get this gorgeous coconut aroma. And what I used to do, I, I don't do so much anymore, is uh, I used to make a lot of wine. So you could just make wine out of this, but my favourite wine at this time of year used to be dandelion flower and gorse flower. I really, and I, I like dry wine, so I'd make it strong and dry. So that's a, that's a good, good one to use. But there's this other plant here, you see, just in the hedgerow. So in this hedgerow, we've got, we've got honeysuckle, we've got hawthorn, we've got holly, but we've got this one, 
which is very holly-like again. Look, it's very, actually this is quite pleasant. It's, it's oh, if you want a good scratch, this is the answer. Um, yeah, this is the plant that's in flower here and it's called Darwin's Barberry and it's grown as an escape and we see the one it's probably grown as an escape from. Why has it escaped? You know, why did it want to escape? I think the reason is, although it's in the hedgerow, you know, every plant I think longs like we do to be wild, to be wild and free, not in self-isolation, not in prison, <laughs> wild and free. And you know, hedgerow is a stepping stone to being wild and free. It's more wild and free than it is up there. But we're going to work with it up there because it's much bigger to get some fully open blossoms because it's more in the sun up there uh, to make a syrup. I'll show you how and, and the general process of making a, a floral botanical syrup. But here, what I really need is, uh, I really need a jar. I really need a jar with some vinegar. Do you have one? Yes. Do you? In <laughs> my pocket. Do you? A jar with a So if I look around, just possibly. Ah! Look, it just so happens. You know, I thought it was going to be easier than that. I I'll spot it immediately. So this, this, this actually, not this morning, late last night, what I've done is you see the ones that are fully in flower. I didn't get those. I got these ones, which can you see they're fully closed or there. Look, can you see those or there even better. So sorry, you see me picking those. You see that? So I'll, what's nice to do at this time of year is get these clusters. Bearing in mind, you know, it's a, it's a similar situation to picking elderflowers in the sense that, you know, elderflowers are wonderful, but they also give way to the wonderful elderberries. Look at your forearm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know, just like a little... Borderline. No, no harm done. Uh, <laughs> what was I saying? Uh, yeah, like, like, like elderflower, which gives way to lovely elderberries. This too gives way that the, the Darwin's Barberry, did I say what it was? Uh, Berberis Darwinii, gives way to lovely clusters of little purple berries, a bit like the size of a bilberry, but really juicy um, and well worth harvesting. So yeah, so just bear that in mind. Now, this is, I do, where possible, it doesn't always work like this, but I like to do raw pickles. So what I put in here is just some cider vinegar and I'm gonna fill, I, I put a few in, but what I really want to do is, I don't want to completely stuff it like I did with the, with the, with the beech leaves into the jar, but I want to loosely fill it, but it's still really important to have the, the whole thing covered with vinegar. So I'll, I'll top that up later. Not only will I top it up, but for like a day or so, um, you know, every time I see it, I'll give it a little shake, a turnaround, like to get the air out, and then I'll top it up with vinegar again. Someone is asking why you get them when they're closed. Okay, there's no reason you couldn't pickle them when they were open, but I, I just like to have them pickled almost kind of like they're a bit like a berry. And I, I find those clusters hold together well. And then what I like to do is just put them on a salad. I put lots of random pickles on salads. So olive oil, some random pickles. So this is one I like to do. But if I was going to use the flowers as a salad, and thanks for the reminder, because I'll get some, is I'll just use them fresh and unpickled because they're beautiful that way. Uh, one other thing here is just to entice you into joining me again is Today, after this video at some point, I'm going to go out and I'm going to harvest lots of bramble stems. Just Sorry, not bramble stems, but new bramble leaf clusters like this. And I'm going to work with them in a very specific way. It's a little bit of a process. So, um, in, and it's going to be part of a video that just looks at the process applied to this and other plants. And 
you know, I hope that intrigues you enough. I might even minutes, 10 more minutes. So, okay, I probably lost a few there because we had some connection issues. Is anyone back with me? No one's back. Wait, just wait. One, six. Six, we've got a few of you back Nine. with me. I lost connection, I'm afraid. Um, but the, the brambles are not, the bramble leaves are not for the salad. Oh, you lost your back. Thanks. Yeah, the bramble leaves aren't for the salad. We get one more salad item. Which is, you see this tree here? This is a lime tree. Probably got some wind noise, I reckon, now. So, um, so we've got young, very young lime leaves. Now these leaves will eventually be kind of about that big, particularly up on the tree. But lime, you often get this growth right at the bottom of the tree. And it's a, it's a really lovely leaf that you can, you can eat raw in salads or Or you can use it as a wrap for various things. It kind of doesn't have much flavour at all. It's just a nice texture. And like many wild foods, if you're just incorporating a range of things into your salad, then you're getting a good range of unique vitamins and minerals that each plant has. Three more things. Do, I do this quickly because we're kind of out, out of out of time. But I want I just want to quickly go into the kitchen after getting something over here and pick a few more flowers. Show you what I'm going to do with that pig nuts. This is all going to happen in five minutes, right, Sarah? Uh, and then <laughs> we're done. So a couple of things for the salad. I'm going to get some nice dandelion leaves. In fact, I like bitter, so I could just eat a salad just of dandelion leaves, to be honest. Yep. I'm going to get some flowers. I think this one is, is one of the quinces. I think it's dwarf quince or, or Chinese dwarf quince or something. So these beautiful flowers you can put in a salad. Up there. I was looking underneath because sometimes the way I discovered this plant years ago is I saw all the hard quinces just lying on the ground in someone's garden and I thought well why aren't they using those because you can use those to make quince jelly and it's not quite the same as um, the quinces that you would get from a shop because they're much smaller but it still makes a lovely jelly but it's the first time I became aware of the plant. So I'm just going to show you the Darwin's Barbary that's in the full sun and look, a tray, amazing. So what I would normally do is put these into a, a polythene bag or something, then when I, when I get home, I would put them on a tray like this and leave them for and leave them for about half an hour before I start making syrup. And the reason being, I don't know if you can see Sarah, but look, look there we go. There's a spider. Something. Can you see that? And then, perhaps later in the day, there would have been more little black beetles, and often the flowers, so you don't want those in your, in your syrup. And obviously, it's not just that, but you want to give them a chance to, to escape. So we're just going to the house, and I'll show you what I did with these earlier. And I think there won't be any wind noise in the house unless there's a gale blowing in the house, but I don't think so. Any 
questions. Someone asked for the name of these. Uh, Darwin's Barbary, Berberus darwinii. How many insects have you eaten in your life, Fergus? <laughs> How many insects? Um, what, knowingly, well, hopefully, not as many as I could have done if I didn't do things like this, but given that I do great. Are you ready? 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 No. We're live. Fine. Are we live? Are you ready? Is so, uh, it five minutes? Okay. Are you ready? No, five <laughs> minutes. <laughs> we're going to see a play, amazing play. No, you're going to be oh. you in it. Oh, we're in the play. I'm a, I'm a, what am I? A dog. I think I'm a dog. I've got one line, which is something like, come sing with us. <laughs> and I say it with the donkey. So, let me just show you my way. And my way is, now I do this with most floral botanical syrups. I put them in a jar. Now, by the way, this is not the only way. Absolute basics would be boil some water, stick your flowers in, let it simmer or even not, just put it in the hot water, put a lid on um, and you're done. But what I like to do is I like to trap all the aromatics if I can. So put them in a jar, heat some water. And if I had more time, I would have absolutely filled this jar, by the way. But I've got important business. I've, I've, got, I've got the part, as I said, there's a dog in a play and it's in a few minutes. So, so anyway, heat the jar. I'm going to start practicing my lines. Like, woof, woof. Come and uh, woof, sing with us. Woof. That's my lines. I was showing it this morning. So jar nice and hot. Lid ready. Hot water. Trap the aromatics, leave it, and here's one I prepared earlier. So, leaving that for until it's cool, essentially, then I, I actually squeezed it through a fine, fine nylon, and that's the colour, not as orange as you would think. So, what I would now do with this, but I can't because I've just used my jar to put the flowers in. So what I would then do with this is put this in a jar like that. In fact, I will do it. Let's do it. Let's see what this could be doing. Put that in a jar like that. So this is cold now and Add some sugar. Give it a shake. And I did. give it a shake to dissolve. And then da -da -da, re sterilize it about 90 degrees for. 45 minutes or something like that but that's trapping in all that aromatics and other ways of trapping all the aromatics um, the final thing would be now this is just me being slightly absurd because we talked about how really pig nuts are just a kind of a one-off thing I, I'm just very fortunate I live in a place where there are thousands of pig nuts just growing on the property. So what we could do with this, a nice thing to do is kind of pan fry them with butter and honey, um, a bit like you would, like chestnuts are done. That's really nice and just have it with a dessert or something. But something that I've only done once before and it was last week and it just so happens it was the same day that some friends on uh, a forum that I belong to and of my association which I belong to, which, check it out because it's so good. Um, it's the Association of Foragers, and lots of us putting out videos on, on things. But one person was saying, what at this time of year can you use to make nut milk? And I was like, 
it just so happened that that morning I had got these and because every morning on my breakfast I have almond milk and I make it fresh every day with almonds. I get, get about five almonds. Almonds, almonds. Um, and that's what I do on my porridge. But we're going to have pig nut milk. So I'm going to say goodbye. I'm going to toast you with a very special. <laughs> yes, what are you say? Uh, <laughs> cup of pig nut milk uh, with wonderful froth that I've created, and see you. Next time on what day? What day is it today? It's Thursday. 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 On Monday at 10. Cheers. And cheers to the tadpoles. Yeah. So, let's see, let's see. How do I save it? There we are. Um, right now, where's the...